Hey everybody, it's Topnosis, and we've got Carl, I'm gonna say your name wrong, it's Carl Abrahamson, did I do it right? Yeah. Hey! You did it right, yeah. Yeah, go me. Uh, you should know who he is, because you're interested in, uh, the esoteric and the occult and Gnosticism, and if you don't, uh, go to Carl Abraham, oh, I, I, Carl Abrahamson.com and find out all about him. He does a lot, folks. Uh, he's incredibly prolific, but, uh, his contributions are, are endless, and it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to finally have him on the show. Uh, Carl, we're, uh, we're gonna just jump right into it because you have a new, newish book. I mean, you always have new books. Uh, out, but, uh, we're gonna be talking about source magic as well as anything else you, you want to talk about. So, uh, getting right in there, I, you know, to start, I think the title itself is gonna raise some questions for people, because the full title is Source Magic, The Origin of Art, Science, and Culture. And, you know, I think some people, their head's gonna be like, wait a minute, isn't magic something separate from art? Definitely something separate from science? Uh, I don't know about culture, but it doesn't seem to be very mainstream in culture. So, so can you tell us about that title? Absolutely. I think uh, it is a pretty good title, and it relates to one of the chapters in the book. Um, and it basically comes from uh, me and you know many other people too, sort of thinking about what are the origins of all, all our ex our experience, all of our culture, what we're doing, you know, and you can trace it back to what we call. Um, uh, historical time, you know, when we can see, find remnants, scraps, archaeological evidence, you know, that kind of thing. And before that is like mythical time. Uh, and of course, the, the, the early sources are in mythical time. But there are enough uh, historical time evidence, like these classic uh, cave paintings and, and all these things, uh, remnants of musical instruments like Brahms and and primitive tools and stuff like that. So we can create some kind of um, hopefully adequate picture of what was going on, what was motivating uh, our ancestors. And of course, they had the same motivation as we do. And that's basically survival. Uh, we are living in a much more complex era with a lot more avenues, also traps, a lot more technology, uh, but in sort of losing touch with nature. So we could say that they probably were in dire straits also, but on a different levels. Their immediate threats came from their immediate surroundings. And so how do you cope with this? How can you survive? Well, you can do the fight and flight. You know, you can, you know, assist or you can run away and thereby you survive. And it helps if you have a little tribe, you can defend each other, etc. But all of it, sort of this kind of uh, inner world that we have, um, I believe, and its potential to sort of view things on the inside in meditations. We close our eyes, we sort of um, check out, you know, basically what we have inside us. That's not something unique to us in this particular era. It has traveled on in human beings. And I argue, uh, people can argue against me if they want to, but I argue that this kind of experience where we use our inner interpretation uh, of external data in a way and uh, use that to help us survive. I believe that that has traveled onwards and is completely embedded in our genetics, right? So it's not only fight and flight. It's about us interpreting data uh, in a different way. You know, if I someone smacks me on the cheek, it will hurt and I say, ouch, that's a causal process. I know what happened, but what if I sort of start praying to the ancestors or praying to the spirit of the deer that exists in the forest uh, right by the cave where I am and, and sort of, please, deer, uh, grant me the opportunity to <laughs> hunt you down and kill you and eat you. And, you know, that kind of thinking is it, not so far-fetched. We all have it, even today. Uh, we don't have to scratch the surface very much. You know, people are praying. They're praying to different gods. People are interpreting data in different ways. People use magical thinking all the time. This key question in our existence, what if, you know, what if I did this? What if I do this? You know, and that's even the foundation of, of uh, the scientism, you know, the empirical method that we hold so holy. And it's great. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, but the foundation even of empiricism is uh, basically that 
there is a wild speculative uh, question there. And that is, what if I mix these two ingredients? What if I look at the planet from this angle? You know, there's always, th that's the, the um, origin of whatever then becomes churned through an empirical uh, technology or an empir empirical method that may or may not lead to progress. It could also lead to a dud, but it always begins with that question, what if? And also uh, hypnagogic, hypnopompic um, input. You know, where do our ideas come from? Where do the ideas of scientists come from? It's not all cogitation. It's not all deduction, logical. Uh, you know, the origins come from somewhere else. And and um, if you're uh, if you have a religious bent, you could argue that well, it comes from God or it comes from from the gods. You know, I think for safety's sake, based on my own experience, I say it comes from inside. It comes from different layers of of my psyche, of my consciousness. Um, and I'm not an uh, island. I'm not an isolated part. I am completely part of the totality, which includes all other human beings and all other beings too, and the biosphere in itself. So with that perspective, which is inherently for me very, very agnostic, um, yeah. in a kind of, what do you call it, monistic kind of way, uh, I believe that uh, we can um, totally create change by what's usually called a sympathetic um, angle, meaning if you affect change in the small, you can also have that change manifest in the in the big picture and vice versa, of course. So uh, I think the foundation of magical thinking is rooted in this kind of holistic uh, outlook. And I'm pretty, pretty certain that our ancestors way, way back, even in mythical times, had that and that it has traveled with us uh, throughout the millennia uh, into what we have today. Uh, today, we have different superstructures that are basically very, very hyper, uber rational, you know, for good and for bad. Uh, but uh, as I said, it doesn't take a lot of scratching on the surface to find what's there. Uh, it's intuition, it's uh, reverie, it's daydreaming, it's a creativity that, that has nothing to do with artistic prowess or skill. To be creative is simply to look at a situation uh, in different ways and create something new, create a new solution. And that's what we've always done. And that could, that's our blessing, of course, could also turn out to be, we'll find out soon. <laughs> it was also our curse, you know, that we're mm -hmm. too smart and too audacious and too uh, hubristic that we have lost the monistic or holistic perspective. Um, on a bad day, I feel that that's the case. On a good day, I can feel there's still some hope, but we need to reconnect. And that's basically where this uh, sort of uh, neo-shamanic perspective comes in that is very tied to the source magic. We need to connect with the source. So what is the source? I would say it's, it's sort of the life energy itself. And that, for me, exists very much in our connection with greater nature. I mean, that's nature, that's the forests, that's the oceans, that's um, the uh, world that's much more powerful than we are. And I'm not saying that we should, you know, succumb to or subjugate our great human egos and wills and endeavors uh, to becoming some sort of self-serving farmers again. That's not the point. Uh, but to be more in tune so that we can listen to and see what's actually going on. Because there are always a lot of things going on. Bad things, good things. And I think that that um, this source is basically, I don't know, uh, some kind of reconnection with a consciousness in ourselves that allows for uh, you know, being in touch with this very same consciousness that exists in greater nature. That's basically the source magic. How do we go there? How do we get there? And I think the the uh, neo-shamanic approach, um, and I call it neo-shamanic, that's a term, because it's basically some indigenous cultures have real unbroken traditions and lineages to shamanic times. They are still shamanic. But in the West, we have to sort of uh, and I don't mean this in a negative way. We have to appropriate and see what works for us uh, in this time where we basically lost it, you know. But it's very easy to get to. You start listening to yourself, start doing meditation, you know, these drum journeys, these very basic uh, techniques and tools are readily available at basically no cost. And that's, and then we come to this point, that's where you have to start 
listening to yourself and trusting that what you're experiencing in these inner planes that is real and it's valid and it's worth something and not just like oh it's just reverie just daydreaming or even worse it's just fantasy or projection but anything that we experience on the inner planes is is real you know uh, i'm not saying that it should, it should guide you 100 percent but you should learn to listen to signals and information coming from inside of you and i would argue that the inside here uh, where we can connect through which we can connect is directly connected to the greater nature so any information that is um, existing in the uh, holistic big picture we can easily access it's like an epistemological pipeline in a way because that's the main question also in Gnosticism, you know, yeah. where does knowledge come from? Yeah, absolutely. And the, I mean, there's so much to unpack there, but, you know, a couple of threads. I, I really like how you're talking about it as this this capacity in humanity, right? And it does stretch all the way back without it being this sort of occult trope of, of ancient wisdom. You know, sometimes I, I try to be a good and a holy man, uh, uh, Carl, and I try not to argue with people, but it, it happens to the best of us. And, you know, sometimes I'll be uh, having a discussion about Gnosticism, probably with somebody online. And, you know, they'll quote some text or book. Uh, they'll talk about the ancient Gnostics. And, you know, I'll be like, well, if the ancient Gnostics were here, if I showed them a car, they would they would vomit and shit themselves at the same time. Right. Also, it's a dead tradition. Uh, like we were talking about with neo-shamanism, of course, there are shamanisms that that exist uh, in unbroken continuity. But at the same time, you know, Gnosticism doesn't really have unbroken continuity. We need to construct it uh, for the modern age. Um, so, yeah, I really like how you're talking about it as as this, this capacity, which I, I think we can learn about how to engage with this capacity by examining the teachings and the knowledge of the ancients. But at the same time, it's, it's, not, it's not something that belongs to them that they're passing on to us. It's something that that we all have that perhaps due to their societal constraints uh, and the the worldviews that they lived in that it's sometimes they were closer to. Um, and also, yeah, I like that you you opened up talking about survival because you know again you're talking about ancient peoples and the connection between survival and, and this capacity. But I think now survival is probably on a lot of people's minds, right? And whenever you turn on the news, it's uh, it's always bad news. And I wonder, too, if what you're talking about, like like what you're saying on, on the good days, perhaps this will be something that will not only allow us to survive, but also to to thrive. So you, you kind of answered this question, but, to, you know, pull on another thread of what you're talking about. Like, what motivated you to, to write the book? Like, what are what are its specific origins? Right. Well, it's it's um, I am obsessed with something that I have called magical anthropology. And it's basically um, I would call it the science or a philosophy. Uh, studying how the human being uh, as an individual or as communal cultures uh, on all levels, all times, how human beings relate to the phenomenon of magic. And, and if you wanted to define that, it's, it's um, you know, creating a causal effect through pretty uh, a-causal or irrational methods, uh, also including this kind of connection that we talked about just now um, in decision-making, for instance, and also communal uh, ecstasy or individual ecstasy. I'm not talking about the 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 drug. But I'm using about the human beings' need for transcendence. And you know we've found it in in many religions and in many uh, cultic or or tribal behaviors, and also through um, sexual activities and physical activities and 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 meditation and, and and things like that. And it's also I would argue an inherent human need to transcend uh, our mind. Um, not constantly. That would there would delve into insanity, <laughs> but temporarily, it's kind of like health. Uh, it's a healthy uh, thing that we need to do uh, to get a wider and better perspective at what we're doing in in our life trajectory. So, magical anthropology looks at these things. It could be looking at uh, practitioners throughout history, contemporary, ancient uh, books that have been written. Uh, behaviors that have been uh, uh, written about that are interesting from this point of view. Um, and I think that it's such an obsession in my case. Uh, I just keep writing about it. I just keep writing uh, essays and I keep writing uh, lectures and it gives me great joy. And then occasionally I stop and look at, you know, what have the, these past years, what have they brought, you know, 
and and so this this book is an anthology of lectures and essays from these past years. Um, and um, as you know, uh, it has diversity. I tend to look at things from a kind of a pop angle. I look at contemporary culture and see if I can find any uh, trails or traces um, giving an indication that it's sort of there's a resurgence in a way in the sphere that we have called culture, the, me the meeting between occult and culture. And we can clearly see that it has become more and more present uh, in the mainstream. And I think, uh, it's just another theory, but I think it's valid, that it has to do with our unconscious, perhaps what Jung called the collective unconscious, uh, needing to uh, help us address these issues at hand. And also finding new avenues and new ways of making decisions about which way to go. You know, so I think uh, for me, the best and most timeless and also in a way the thing that has been esoteric. And I'll talk about the language and symbology of, of uh, alchemy and these things. But basically there, there are symbols uh, that are also very, very real in their endeavor to solve things or to become what they can fully be. And that's the, the image of the seed. The seed is underground. The seed is in the dark soil. Uh, it's completely occulted, yet it has inherent potential. And given um, a basic temperature, water, and nutrition in its surrounding environment, it will strive to pierce the veil of the surface uh, and thereby enter into the sphere of light in a way or, or uh, a different kind of atmosphere, its, its roots are still occult, you know, and that's where you draw the nutrition. But you do your thing, you bloom uh, out there in the um, uh, on the upper le level in a way. And thereby, you also, again, symbolically, but for flowers and plants, actually, literally, you take part in a photosynthetic process that actually gives uh, more beings uh, the possibility to breathe in the photosynthesis uh, process, you know. So I find that image uh, incredibly powerful, and and there's really no need for any kind of uh, occult or symbolic obfuscation that has been so prevalent and, and common in the uh, occult traditions. Uh, we don't need that anymore. We need to be completely clear about what it is. So what is it then? Well, if we look at ourselves as seed, we have the inherent potential to grow into something slightly more than a seed, you know, to bloom, uh, and that we can do. Uh, with our roots firmly uh, attached to the soil, uh, which could be, you know, culture and tradition where we come from, but also being above the surface and seeing that, oh, wow, there are others here and my process can give oxygen to, to all these other people. And some creatures give, you know, different kinds of uh, exhaust fumes <laughs> that I can then process. And, you know, it's, it's some kind of balance, hopefully. So when I look at this, through the with the pop cultural goggles on, I find a lot of things and a lot of people who uh, probably very unconsciously have contributed to this uh, resurgence or this uh, emergence of um, let's call them occultural strains uh, that carry incentive, that carry inspiration, that basically are little door knockers and the doors are attached to people's minds. Uh, and they come in many different shapes and sizes and colors and from different cultures, but they're all part, I think, of a general uh, awakening process that is going on. Yeah. And, and before we get into some of those figures, it, it's not just that I, I, I uh, uh, dogmatically stick to my question list, but uh, you have answered this question, but I just want to hammer it home. But can you explain, uh, clarify, how is magic part of the heritage of, of being human? Yeah, but if we um, immediately, spontaneously think of an image when you say magic, I mean, I'm probably damaged because I've been working with it for so many decades. But if you ask like a normal person, they will probably think of like, you know, stage magic or some kind of showman aspect or a con man or someone tricking someone. Or if you have slightly more uh, cultural historical awareness, you could say that, well, it's a kind of an archetype. It's an archetypical figure, uh, basically in all cultures of a wise man or a wise woman who knows slightly more than others and, and thereby is a little bit feared and respected, but it's because they know that this knowledge and wisdom that these people have can actually affect change uh, causally 
for them that could be beneficial to them or it could be detrimental to them depending on what kind of relationship they have um and i think that that uh, again there is a deep rooted respect for that and perhaps even on a genetic level uh, because culture also travels and uh, sort of you know gets grounded in genetics uh in mythology, you know, there's always been this, uh, whichever mythology we, we're looking at, whichever religious mythology or um, just cultural mythology, there's always the trickster, there's always the magician, uh, and it seems to be a necessary part of a healthy whole um, that I certainly cannot explain, but I think it's just heritage. Uh, it's always been that kind of shamanic force or shamanic figure within each tribe. And the problem then uh, appears when cultures become too complex, when we have too many people living together. Then you, one shaman is not enough. And if you have some kind of teaching that grows a corpus of, of wisdom that the original authors can no longer disseminate. So you need proxy disseminators like priests and, and things that are, you know, people that have taken part of the wisdom and then disseminated by proxy. And sort of gradually, I could see that the shamanic figure, you know, the wild, crazy, transcending figure, sort of pulled back and moved into a mythical sphere instead of an actual sphere. Um, or just, you know, as they do, uh, shifted shape, a uh, shape-shifting quality in which it's no longer perhaps semantically about magic, but they're still doing cultural magic by affecting change that is necessary and healthy. In a way, you can see maybe that the, the magician or the shaman is sort of like um, a trickster figure that deals with the immune defense system of the organism. Sometimes you, you can create a little infection or a sore to pinpoint we need to make this healthy and whole, uh, sort of whole again, if, so that the organism can be uh, healthy, you know. But there's this function that points to where things are ailing where things are imbalanced, where things are uh, actually infected. And, and everybody needs that. If we didn't have an uh, immune defense system, we would just die from any kind of virus, you know. And I think that's uh, one way of looking at it, you know, strictly mythical, you know, the fanciful magician in stories and fairy tales, uh, or that agent or agency that shows in all the cultures uh, what's wrong and how we can remedy it, and how we can fix it. It's a kind of a hyper-creative way, but not in the standard causal way. Uh, the magician uses other things, uses all things, cosmic forces, uh, what have you, to fix what's wrong. Fascinating. So uh, I guess if we can kind of dive into some of the figures that you discuss in your book, I, I guess uh, some of these figures that, that represent the uh, the ideas that you were just talking about, that represent these figures. But uh, I want to start with Genesis P. Origin, which is how I found out of, uh, about you and your work originally. Mm -hmm. what, what's magical about their work? Yeah, I, I would say uh, more or less everything, because... Um, there's a kind of devotion there, devotion to development for its own sake. And that can be a very, very tricky path to be on. You know, you put yourself at risk, and, you know, uh, perhaps others by proxy. Um, and and Jen was always this kind of um, artist, but I would say artist magician, uh, who stretched those, pushed those boundaries and stretched, you know, uh, givens, within the art world, which at the time, you know, late 60s and into the 70s, it's pretty, you know, open-minded because of the sort of, I would guess, the psychedelic infusion during the 60s. So the art world was sort of crazy in a way, and that reflected uh, itself in kind of crazy art and sort of artists that could really push the boundaries. And, and um, uh, specifically with performance art, you had this thing where you used your own body and thereby also your own mind to be part of that stretching, to be part of that transcendental experience. It's not just some, you know, Marcel Duchamp who's a brainiac and makes these funny, punny, ironic things. It's like being on the ground floor and doing these weird things that have distinctly ritualistic qualities. And, and uh, that's basically how, what Gen Genesis told me about how he became interested in magic per se was through this kind of um, spontaneous, intuitive 
ritual performances that created such change within him and also in the altar, meaning it had a magical effect. Um, so, and then of course it, it became more and more thematic after having passed through the sort of bleak existentialism of, of industrial music and throbbing gristle, and then going into slightly more constructive uh, theories and practices in the Temple of Psychic Youth and the band Psychic TV, um, which was to create a contemporary occult or occultural network that was kind of a magical order, but at the same time also a network, um, at the same time encouraging people to do create magical art. You don't have to be an artist, you just create magical art for yourself and see what happens. So that kind of devotion to a constant kind of development uh, I think is one of the key things that makes Jen still magical. You know, we made a documentary film uh, together and it was called Change Itself. And that's an answer in it to my question, you know, what are you about? And Jen answered, I think it's change itself. You know, the, what's behind, you know, what's around the corner, what's behind the, this uh, hindrance uh, to constantly uh, try to uh, improve, sometimes make mistakes, but to constantly, uh, during a lifetime, lifespan, uh, see what's possible, you know. And I think Jen did a great job. And I think um, uh, the work will remain valid and important for a long time. And I'm very happy, of course, to have been part of some of that. But then specifically of the book Sacred Intent, which was is an anthology of interviews that we made together between 1986 and 2019. I mean, that's a wide span of theoretical development uh, is um, sort of magical in itself. Yeah. Uh, what do the beat poets have to do with the occult? Well, I would say n n really nothing, uh, you know, uh, uh, unless they as individuals had an interest or inkling, you know, uh, Kerouac was certainly interested in, in Buddhism. But I think what you're um, getting at is like from the book, write about, you know, uh, William Burroughs and Brian Geis and specifically for okay. both uh, part of what, let's call it the Topi, the Temple of Psychic Youth mythos in a way. And and I can see why. And they were very interested in magic, uh, mostly coming from, in Geis's case, uh, the times spent in Northern Africa, uh, which is a place imbued with magic, uh, some of it much older, uh, you know, really traditional, and not specifically um, Islamic. Uh, or Muslim, um, and Barros had this thing and they worked on, you know, the cut-up technique where you have something that is given, whether it's a text you've written or a text you're reading, and what happens if you cut it up and then reassemble it in a random way? Is there a system there? Can it reveal something? And they found uh, that um, it did to them. You know, for other people, it could be gibberish. You know, it could be like... Um, uh, worth nothing, no no rational thought, nothing. But it's true when you try it to basically deassemble and then reassemble in a random way. It's an interesting experiment, I have to say. And I, I worked with it specifically in, in writing more conceptual or artistic texts. And I think that what they what makes these two gentlemen magical is the fact that they also wanted to uh, push boundaries and see what happens if I do this? What if uh, happens if I leave the safe haven, of what I'm already acquainted with, you know, writing a narrative in a certain way? What if I leave that and try to just jumble it up and cut it up and bring in random aspects? That in itself is is uh, is magical. And I think that their experiments gave a validity to their impression that magic is a real thing from having been in these sort of magical cultures being influenced by that. And then also very, very, very important, not just as a cool thing, but to actually integrate it into their artistic practice, which they did. Yeah. Uh, what is individuation and how can magic help with the process? Uh, individuation, um, uh, I'm not sure of the exact origin, but it's usually associated with the Jungian uh, school of psychology, where it's a key term. And, and it's basically, um, we can find it in, you know, newer uh, occult uh, clusters too, like Crowley's Thelema, for instance, where you have to sort of find your will and do your will. Uh, that sounds simplified, but it's 
anyone knows it's very complex and hard to do. Yeah. But uh, individuation specifically is basically the same thing to become this thing that I talked about before, you know, going from seed level onto plant level. Uh, that's a good analogy for that also. There are many things that have to be in place. Uh, when we're talking about actual seed, it's just like nutrients in the soil, water, temperature, and then up it's oxygen and, and carbon monoxide and all, uh, you know many things that are needed. But for a human being, it's slightly more complex because we are so smart and so devious and the people we trick the most are ourselves. You know, uh, we're self-deceptive. <laughs> so basically, I think one quality that is very important for individuation is honesty, you know, and, and um, it's not only about, it's about listening to yourself. It's about, you know, am I really interested in this or am I actually interested in that? You know, that kind of honesty, because you are invested already from birth with, in, uh, you know, projections in your name, in your culture, you know, what your parents hope for you to be, usually based on their disappointments with their own lives. It's a very complex thing. And the main thing in individuation is to be stern, crazy stern, and really follow your own intuition. So that's another word with I, you know, <laughs> and I would say intelligence is also another one of those that are needed for individuation. You have to be intelligent. You have to listen to yourself, you know, honest, and then um, trust your intuition, and then really make decisions based on what you, your inner core decides not what your inherent, you know, the culture you've been brought up in or, or the society or uh, sort of these arbitrary authorities. Um, that's an individuation process very schematically, you know, described. Yeah. Uh, what does Ezra Pound, uh, the famous poet, uh, have to do with uh, Austin Osmond's fair? That's a great question. <laughs> well, it, it's, it's, I wrote an essay uh, or a lecture, actually, that's in the book. Uh, about what I call sui genericism. And again, it's not just like a punny, punny, funny thing. Uh, sui generis is usually, it's a Latin expression, meaning um, something so brilliant, it's on its own, you know, something of its on its own level, one of a kind in a way. And a sui genericism uh, came to me when I was thinking about similarities between these two people. I mean, they were living uh, more or less at the same time. They were great. You know, um, Austin Spare was a British uh, artist, draftsman, painter who also had this occult system uh, lined out that he also published in books. Ezra Pound, of course, was one of the key modernist uh, poets, very influential for uh, people like Joyce and, and uh, people of that ilk and that scene. Um, and uh, they were both brilliant uh, conceptualizers, conceivers, of new ways of using their uh, specific techniques, you know, whether pound with poetry, uh, whether, you know, uh, Austin Spare sort of uh, being such a brilliant draftsman, he had, you know, could have had the um, commissions from very powerful and wealthy people, but he preferred to stay in the pub and, and, and sort of uh, draw and paint pub punters and sell them really cheaply uh, because their own worlds were so important to them. They, I would argue that they were actually holy, this sort of self-isolation thing. However, to avoid, and this is my psychological theorizing here, to avoid scrutiny from the outside and pro negative projections, they also came up with systems. You know, uh, Pound liked to be a didactic teacher of poetry and teacher of literary criticism. It wasn't enough to just be it. He wanted to have to be the authority of his own system. And the same thing was true with Spare uh, in that sense that he wasn't content with just being the magician uh, painting magical pictures. He also wrote about it, systematized it, and thereby became the authority of that system. And I think it's a psychological defense mechanism in certain people who tend to become uh, psychically overheated in their brilliance. Um, maybe maybe I think that might be a little bit more obscure for for some people, which is Derek Jarman. You know, why does his work matter, and and what's the magic of it? Mm -hmm. uh, Derek Jarman was a, a British filmmaker who was um, 
sort of coming out in the 1970s. He'd worked as a set designer for pretty big films like Ken Russell's The Devils. And, but he always favored, again, this sort of independent filmmaking, working on Super 8 and sort of uh, being able to control the medium himself to get that perfect visionary quality. And he, the films that I really love and that affected me, uh, I think as a person, but also as a uh, filmmaker at times, uh, is this kind of um, absolute will to not compromise in creating or manifesting your own vision. For him, it was very much a, um, uh, there was a thematic thing. He was very interested specifically in medieval occultism uh, and also practicing magician uh, in that sense. Uh, but he also, just like this, these beat guys that we talked about, he wove in his own creativity in the magical theory and praxis, and also vice versa. You know, his films were imbued with uh, with an intent, with a, the intention, and I would say that is mainly about opening people's minds, you know, in that kind of, I wouldn't say just merely psychedelic way, but in a literal spiritual way, in a transcending way, transcendent way. Uh, that's how it worked for me in a kind of an inexplicable way when I saw his films as a teenager. The films are not about anything, you know, not the films that I like. They're just like experiments in, in form in a way. But they do affect me, you know, even when I watch them now, I've watched them many, many, many times. And of course, in his case, there was also this uh, mix or merger with another field of interest for me, which was the industrial culture, because the film that I love the most, it's called In the Shadow of the Sun, uh, Throbbing Gristle, meaning Genesis Bjorge's project in the late 70s to very early 80s, uh, they scored the soundtrack for that film. So that sort of, it was one of those crystallization uh, moments when I saw that film the first time. Um, it's not even love, it was just like, it blew my mind, as they say. And I couldn't explain at the time Maybe now I can a little bit more, but, but I don't want to. I just want to have that, you know, immersion. And uh, actually to the point where I made a film much later, I think in 2015, I made my own sort of Super 8 epos uh, called In the Shadow of the Moon or Sub Umbra Alarum Luna with music from my band at the time, Cotton Ferox. Uh, it's like a tribute to their drama. And I wanted to sort of pay back for all these wonderful experiences. But again, there's an artist who is interested in magic, who uses magic and, and, and uh, explores his own creativity and his creative expressions with that mind frame. And that also, of course, affects the magic back, you know, integrating the artistic expression in the magical research. Yeah. I mean, you've discussed this with, with Genesis P. Origin and, and right now with, uh, with Derek Charman, but can you tell us a bit about your journey and your work and, and what it has to do with, with the themes and the people discussed in the book and some of their inspiration and how some of it's been incorporated into your multitudinous? I mean, you know, the, for people who don't know, you are a musician, a writer, a filmmaker, uh, the publisher, a dot, 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 a whole lot of other things, too. So. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, it, it's... Um... I think basically uh, I started out uh, being very interested in culture. I come from a very cultured home and they were all highbrow, you know, so I became a little bit more uh, lowbrow in a way, looking at, you know, underground comics, weird rock and roll, uh, B-movies, that kind of thing. Um, not necessarily as a kind of contrarian uh, perspective or a teenish rebellion, but I really like this thing where people fight to have their vision, you know, um, independent filmmakers working hard or band that sort of tours and tours um, there's a kind of romance there and for me my t real talent I think is, is writing looking at things and writing about them and telling other people about what I've experienced and that was uh, there formatted er early on I, I created a a fan scene for comics where I interviewed some comic book artists and then it drifted into weird music and movies and then it drifted into the, the Fenris Wolf, this journal that I still actually have. And I trained to be a journalist and, and I worked as a journalist for, for some years. Uh, and uh, basically, it's me going out into the world, orienting myself, not from, you know, by what an editor has told me, you know, but, oh, I'm so interested in what this person is doing. So I'm going in that direction, immersing myself in whatever is going on. And then I 
write about it and then I present it to other people. And I think maybe it's a specifically Swedish thing too, because it's, it's such a small country, you know, uh, such a small country. And if uh, there are no like real suffering geniuses here, maybe Strindberg was one, uh, but we're great repackagers. You know, you have IKEA. They take great design ideas from the world and repackage it for the world. <laughs> I mean, maybe I'm the IKEA uh, or, or cultural guy in the sense that I take pretty co complicated um, concepts from from throughout human history, and I sort of write about them in a very accessible way. I would say and that's sort of the feedback I usually get: that oh, this was really fun to read about these weirdos, uh, and and that's I think the spirit that I'm working in. Uh, and I hope to do that for, for, for the rest of my life, you know, whether the form is a film or a, or a text or a book or, or whatever, you know, uh, I, I, um, again, I, uh, listen to my intuition. I can see myself changing. Oh, so I'll go in that direction instead and see what's there. And very likely I'll report back, you know, to, to not the Swedes <laughs> particularly, but to, to the world, to the, to, for, you know, find the others. And, and tell them what I've experienced. Yeah. Okay, folks, that's uh, carlabrahamson.com. We're going to have the link uh, down below, so uh, check out all of his work. Uh, to keep the show going, you can go to patreon.com slash Gnostic for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. Uh, it allows us to uh, keep having a show. We're trying to put out uh, a lot more per month. We don't really give you anything for contributing to the Patreon, but you get early access to the shows. We're hoping to give people stuff, but we don't want to lock up content behind a paywall. You can also do one-time donations at paypal.me slash Gnostic. Carl, it's been amazing. Uh, everybody go out and get the book. Get all of this book. The, well, there's a lot. You get all the Fedris Wolf. Um, yeah. get, uh, get everything. Uh, treat yourself. You deserve it. And uh, uh, Carl, I hope that you'll come back on the show because uh, obviously there, there's always more to talk about. So I would love to. Anytime. Awesome. Take care, man. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.